turn Psalm 58 this morning. Psalm 58 is linked to yesterday's psalm, Psalm 57, in that it is one of these three psalms in a row, the third being tomorrow, that has as its introduction, all tashchet, do not destroy. And it's linked to a moment, at least for the rabbis and the commentaries, linked to a moment of danger in David's life. And I'll return to that moment um, shortly as to what they see is the moment. In contrast to yesterday, that moment here is not described. Also, there is in verse 1, the attribution calling this a michtam, which I noted yesterday, is a word that we don't exactly know what it means in its biblical context, but later would be understood as an aphorism. So a very short introduction and then a very angry psalm. And we're not taught in the psalm itself what it is that the psalmist is reacting to. It is it something personal or communal, but what is distinctive is that with verse 2, the psalmist is addressing leaders. That's distinctive. It's the only psalm that opens with a direct confrontation verbally with the leaders, or in this case, specifically judges. Now, while the psalm trajectory is pretty clear, it's a description in the first six verses to evil done by judges. The second half is a prayer, verses 7 to 12. It is distinctive as a psalm with kind of obscure poetic words and double entendres as possibilities that I will look to point out. One Bible scholar, Dahud, says that this psalm is among the most difficult to, un, to, to translate of all the psalms. And I'll have fun sharing with you as we look at this psalm, both the historical context, this is the opportunity to get these windows into David's turbulent life, but also to look at some of the ambiguity in the details while the trajectory is very clear. May the judges who misjudge be severely punished. Benjamin C Benji Siegel, who has his birthday today, a rabbi in Jerusalem who has a wonderful literary commentary on the Psalms. He entitles this Psalm, Smash Their Teeth, which as you'll see is one of the lines. I go one step further in terms of another image in the Psalm, which is more graphic. The just shall bathe feet in the blood of the wicked. That's a an extreme image. We'll see later, some would see it only as metaphorical, like Samson Raphael Hirsch. Others, well, see it as more than simply metaphorical. With that, let me share this screen. Um, Helene, you have to make me, uh, you have to make me able to share. If you're Helene, you have to make me able to share as a host. Okay. <clears throat> One second. Helene. Okay. I switched over to the host. Thank you, Helene. Appreciate it. All right. Psalm 58. Let me read it through, then I'm going to read to you some of the story of King David and what the rabbis see this as describing. 
and then we'll look at some of those difficult multiple possible uh, translations and conclude with why this psalm. For the conductor of Al Tashchit, of David and Michtam, really? Do you leaders of justice speak? Upright ones? Shall, ju shall you judge people? Not. In your heart, misdeeds you work on earth, violence your hands met out. Estranged are wicked from the womb, astray from birth are speakers of lies. Their venom is like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf viper that closes its ear so as not to hear the word, hear the voice of charmers, cunning casters of spells. God smash their teeth in their mouth, the molars of lions shatter Adonai. Let them melt away as water that moves away quickly. When arrows are aimed, let them be cut down like a snail that melts as it moves, like the stillbirth of a woman that does not see the sun. Before their tender briars ripen into thorns, the green and the chart alike, may the storm blow them away. The just shall rejoice on seeing vengeance shall bathe feet in the blood of the wicked, and a person shall say, Surely there is fruit for the just, surely there are gods judging in the earth. Let me actually this time, instead of beginning with the story of King David, talk about some of these possible um, choices of translation. I'm going to work backwards because it's the punchline. Verse 12, you can see that I translated this last phrase as, surely there are gods, plural, small g, judging in the earth. As we see, as we have seen repeatedly in Hebrew, we don't have capital letters, so we don't know if the text is referring to God with a capital G or a small g. In this case, there's a mixed understanding among classic commentators. And here's the, ta the challenge. The verb judging, shoftim, is in the plural. So we often see Elohim, which is a plural, as the name of God. Martin Buber, the great Bible scholar and theologian, said that Elohim is in the plural as Ela means the, this, and that God is all the these, the collection of all. God contains all, which is to say God's name of Elohim is a plural name, but usually is accompanied by a singular verb. Nonetheless, many translators, the translation in the Mitsuda, the translation of the early Aramaic, the Targum, or, or David Kimchi, the medieval Spanish commentator, make this a capital G. So it's the closing prayer, which we're kind of familiar with. Surely there is a God judging in the earth. But more interestingly is to play with the other possibilities, which is for Radak as well, that important Spanish commentator on Psalms, and Ibn Ezra, another important medieval commentator on Psalms. This is a small g, but here they translate it as referring to the ministering angels. So that the image is, as in many parts of the story of the Bible, God allocates, delegates responsibility to angels to do the administration of justice. But there's the other possibility, and that is that the beginning of this psalm, verse 2 and 3, refers to leaders of justice. It's a, a lem Tzedek, right? Leaders of justice. That's talking to people. There, there's a consensus. This is distinctive in that the Psalter, the Psalmist, 
is addressing humans. And so this is coming, inclusio, full circle. To say that the evil judges have been destroyed, leaving good judges to rule. Robert Alter, a modern commentator, who of course is freed from needing to see this in historical term, I mean, well, needing to see this in monotheistic terms, he, Robert Alter, in his translation says that the psalm is not necessarily addressing monotheists, that indeed there may be multiple gods evoked by the psalmist. I tend not to relate to that because I think that these psalms were distilled, but that's a possibility. And so this is a psalm that opens with clarity. It's attacking injustice. In that sense, it's another psalm, like yesterday, not necessarily about David as an individual, but righteous indignation about corruption in society. Righteous indignation as describing a lack of righteousness by those who wield power. Some other interesting little plays, and that is the word for leaders, often translated as do you community of justice, and that is that a lem is related to almim, which is a bundle of grain. So there's an image of a lem as a collective. By the way, I in part translated this after seeing Borat, which is a distinctive translation. So you'll see verse three begins not, you know, that's a little bit influenced. Let me give you an example of how this psalm in verses two and three often sound a little bit different to show you that quality. Here is Adin Steinsaltz's translation of two and three. Do you violent men really speak with righteousness? Do you judge men honestly? You plan wrongful deeds in your heart with your hands you met out injustice in the land. So what I do in translating <clears throat> two and three is I'm actually more literal going word by word. So ha'umnam is often, is also translated like in the art scroll, is it true? Ha'umnam, is it true? So that is, you know, legitimately translated as really? Do you leaders of justice speak? So all of this, of course, is said um, sarcastically. Upright ones? And I break it up. Shall you judge people? Not. And now explaining. In your heart misdeeds you work on earth, violence your hands met out. Um, so this image of, you get the image here, estranged are wicked from birth, astray from birth are speakers of lies. It's to say almost like this seems to be so deeply ingrained in you that it can't be changed, it can't be extracted. Their venom is like the venom of a serpent. Again, second nature to a serpent to protect itself is to have venom. But in this case, it's like a deaf viper. And the image here, not to hear the voice of charmers, cunning casters of spells, Adin Steinsaltz explains as a snake is normally calmed by the voice of the charmer, the spell maker, but this snake is relentless. This snake will not be calmed. It's deaf to that which would transform it. And now the beginning of the prayer, verse seven, smash their teeth in their mouth, the molars of lions. Some instead of molars will have the um, incisors. Let them melt away as water that moves away quickly. When arrows are aimed, let them be cut down. And now verse 9, like a snail that melts as it moves, 
like the still birth of a woman that does not see the sun. So two aspects of that. One is that a snail is in its shell, in that sense does not see clearly like a stillbirth. So this person is blind like the snail. Also the image of like a snail leaves a trail by melting as it moves. So the trail of the unjust is so set. Before the tender briars ripen into thorns, the green and the chart alike, here the, the commentators translate in two opposite ways, Siro Techem. Rashi, the important commentator of the 11th century, he translates this as tender briars, which he refers to as children and his explanation. Before children ripen into hardened criminals, um, but the other way, and more literal way, of siro techem is a pot. A seer is a pot, and it's a, it's a pot that is using thorns to cook with. Either way, the image is of destruction. And here, the overall theme clearly expressed. Yismach tzaddik. So I will add, if you look at verses 2 and 4, and now 11 and 12, you have four key words that are repeated as the inclusio. Those are righteousness, which is tzaddik, show fate in verse 12, to judge, adam, a person, verse 12, and reshaim, the wicked. Verse 11. And so there's an inclusio, a return to the beginning of verses 2 to 4. And here are the shift. The just shall rejoice on seeing vengeance. And again, that disturbing line. I, I, I have it here precisely because I find it's disturbing. Shall bathe or wash. Literally, rachatz is to wash feet. But I used bathe because bathing means a sense of you know staying there longer than washing, a lingering, which felt to me more disturbing because it's such a disturbing image. And with Hebrew, it could be either uh, in the blood of the wicked. And again, Samson Raphael Hirsch says, you know, this is simply an image that, and he, he is a rabbi of Frankfurt, Germany, 19th century very influential, some say the, the visionary of modern orthodoxy. And he will say as an image that just as the, when the just will walk through the pools of blood self-inflicted by the evil on themselves, their feet too will be bloodied and they will be reminded of the punishment of evil that it will lead to your self-inflicted doom. Well, that's the metaphorical reading. But I'm going to now go to reading with you the story. And I'm going to take this off because I like to see all of you to read a bit about the context as the rabbis understand the psalm. Yesterday, we read the story of King David in the cave in En Gedi, and that was part of the introduction. And you may recall that King David cut the corner of the garment, apparently like the shawl of Saul, and when Saul emerged from the cave, David shouted out, Stop! Take a look at your garment. I cut the corner and did not kill you. And Saul says, is that you, David? And begins to cry and say, and then David says, you are, you know, you're hunting me wrongly. I don't seek to hurt you. And Saul says, I was wrong. So now you might think that was like, you know, verses chapter 23. You might think, well, now that's everything's good between them. But that's not the case. This is the final exchange between King David and King Saul. It's the final drama. 
And it's the first book of Samuel. Again, the first book is before King David to this point becomes the king. Second book of Samuel will describe David as king. And here's the story, beginning verse 5. Well, let me begin at the beginning. The Zevites came to Saul at Gibeah and said, David is hiding in the hill of Hachila, facing Yeshimon. And Saul went down at once to the wilderness of Zeb, together with 3,000 picked men of Israel, to search for David in the wilderness of Zeb. Verse 5. David went at once to the place where Saul had encamped. David saw the spot where Saul and his army commander, Abner, son of Ner, lay asleep. Now circle the name, Abner, son of Ner. He's going to be understood by the rabbis as the bad guy, as the, as the false witness, the false judge. And here's what they're going to say Abner said. It's not in the text. They're going to say, Abner said to David, you know, it's not true that David cut your garment. Take a, this garment was torn by a thorn. This was an accident, not an act of David's kindness. And the rabbis will say that Abner's words would convince Saul that he should not trust David. And again, there's a long history there is momentum of Saul seeking to kill David. And so, to edit a bit, Avishai is David's friend, his colleague, who goes with him. And David says to Avishai, there, let's go down, verse 7. David and Avishai approach the troops by night and found Saul fast asleep inside the barricade. His spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the troops sleeping around him. And Ab Abishai says to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Let me pin him to the ground with a single thrust of the spear. I will not have to strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, don't do him violence. No one can lay hand on the Lord's anointed with impunity, which is what David had said to the troops also in the cave. And David went on, as the Lord lives, the Lord himself will strike him down, or his time will come and he will die and he will go down to battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay hands on the Lord's anointed. Just take the spear and the water jar at his head and let's be off. So David took away the spear and the water jar at Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew or woke up. All remained asleep. A deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. And so now David escapes, and David shouted to the troops, verse 14, and to Abner, son of Ner, Abner, aren't you going to answer? And Abner shouted back, who are you to shout at the king? And David answered Abner, you are a man, aren't you? And there is no one like you in Israel. So why didn't you keep watch over your Lord, the king? For one of our troops came to do violence to your Lord, the king. You have not given a good account of yourself. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you did not watch over your Lord, the anointed one. Look around. Where are the king's spear and water jar that were at his head? Saul recognized David's voice, and he asked, Is that your voice, my son David? The same words that Saul said at En Gedi. And David replied, It is my lord king. And he went on, But why does my lord continue to pursue his servant? What have I done, and what am I guilty of? Now let my lord, the king, hear his servant out. And Saul will then answer, verse 21, I am in the wrong. Come back, my son David. For I will never harm you again, seeing how you have held my life precious this day. Yes, I have been a fool, and, have I, and I have erred so much. And David replied, Here is your majesty's spear. Let one of the young men come and get it, and the Lord will requite 
every man for his wrong conduct and loyalty. For this day the Lord delivered you into my hands. I will not raise a hand against the Lord's anointed. And then David, going skipping a bit, Saul blesses him. May you be blessed, my son David. You shall achieve and you shall prevail. The last words that Saul will say to David is a blessing. And then David went uh, his way and Saul returned home. Mind you, David still doesn't feel secure. He goes to be among the Philistines and he will live there for a year and four months, according to the next chapter, chapter 27. But here's something else that I read in that same chapter, 27, and it's disturbing to me. And that is David and his men, verse 8, went up and raided the Gusherites, the Gizrites, the Amalekites, who were the inhabitants of the region of Olam, all the way to Shur and the land of Egypt. Verse 9, when David attacked a region, he would leave no man or woman alive. He would take flocks, herds, asses, camels, and clothing. When he returned and came to Achish, who's the Philistine king, Achish would ask, where did you raid today? And David would reply, the Negev of Judah, or the Negev of the Yerachmelites, or the Negev of the Canaanites. So that quality of brutality that David would raid, and that's what he would do while he lived among the Philistines, he would be a marauder and leave no man or woman alive. That I hadn't focused in on in the past, and it's deeply disturbing. Now, to pull all this together, and then some of your reactions, some commentators, modern commentators, would say, well, you have to understand this verse and this description of David in its historical context. And in its historical context, it was not the warfare of our day. It was warfare where you destroyed your enemies. There, you didn't take hostages. You didn't have peace treaties. You were victorious by wiping out your enemy. And we find that in the inscriptions of the wars against Israel. You know, they, they wiped them all out to see that as what the goal was, at least. It's very disturbing. So one is to say, well, that was war then and not now. And the other way people deal with it is they say, well, this is not to be taken literally to the other extreme. It's metaphorical metaphorical, and leaves us with the challenge. We read that God gets angry at people, achar af, and even destroys people in the Bible amidst righteous indignation. And that leaves us with the question, what is it that, if you will, prompts righteous indignation in us? Well, to pull this together, this is a psalm with violence, it's hard for me to relate to that quality of violence. Um, at the same time, it's the opportunity to become aware of David's tumultuous life with another story, and there'll be one uh, tomorrow. These three psalms um, are links for the same player who's identified with poems to God. And that's a tension that I haven't fully resolved. With that, Reactions on your part to Psalm 58. Um, Alex, go ahead. Uh, a couple of reactions. Uh, first, um, I think that references to washing your feet in blood, I find that a reference to, to Abraham washing the angel's feet. Uh, but this time, instead of Washing your feet is something you do to 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 greet someone to to show tender care. This is transformed into in in this is is transformed into into a metaphor for complete victory. Mm. I, I and breaking the teeth. Well, that's referred to in the in the four sons uh, story in in the Haggadah. Right. Uh, so I think clearly breaking the teeth is a metaphor. 
washing your feet and their blood is a is a, is is also a metaphor. Uh, the last thing. I'm Actually, let me stop you there only because I want to react and then you can add the third. I yeah. just want to say that's a, a beautiful, not beautiful, that is a insightful um, image that you link this with, Alex, which is that Abraham, and it's actually this week's Torah reading, greets three strangers and the first thing he does is wash their feet. And that's the promise. That's how you welcome somebody who's been walking on the dirt path and needs to relax and feel renewed. And here, the image is a feet marking the trail, new beginnings being washed in blood as a symbol of victory. Um, still di deeply disturbing, but in terms of first acts, that's a link between washing feet and washing feet in blood in this case. And maybe I should do wash. I'm going to change it from wash to bathe because it's not like you're keeping it there. So that's a helpful um, comment. And the idea of dull their teeth or punch them in the mouth, which is what we're told in the Haggadah regarding the wicked son, is understood metaphorically. It's actually dull their teeth, which also being a metaphor can mean take out the bite in their words, dull it. And your last comment, Alex? Uh, my last comment is that there are remarkable uh, snakes, you know, in the Bible. Uh, the Nahash in the Garden of Eden, of course, and this one has a snake with ears. Um, so, also, wonderful linking of the past. A snake throughout the Bible is a symbol of um, danger, still one of those archetypical um, images in our own world of danger, that be a snake in a grass, you don't see it till it bites, um, it slithers, and that's the Garden of Eden story. And here you get the serpent who hears, who refuses to be tamed or charmed. Um, again, a powerful image, a distinctive image. I think here of the viper who blocks his ear. And I have the image of um, being in India and seeing snake charmers with vipers mm -hmm. with those heads coming up. Yes. And here not being, <clears throat> not being tamed, charmed, but choosing to plug up its ear. Very powerful play on the, as you underscore Alex, on a familiar motif of snake as evil, but here with a whole other dimension of the snake that hears and refuses to hear. Yeah. One last comment, Marvin, and then I'll, uh, and Arnold, I'll take my, my biologist and my chemist, and then I'll pull this together. Go ahead, Marvin. Two things. Snakes do have ears. They don't have pinna. They don't have the cartilaginous outside of the body. The ear as we know it, what we refer to as an ear, but they do have, have the ossicles and all the hearing apparatus, of course. The other thing is that these battles are awfully bloody if you kill every man, woman, child. Yeah. So having feet bathed in blood is may refer to the fact that your feet are bathed in the blood of the people that have been slain. How can you avoid a battle of that sort yeah. without having blood? So it's not a it's not an act of actually bathing the feet uh, when you say bathed in blood. It's bathed in blood because of the battle. So two thoughts. That's uh, that Marvin. One is <laughs> I value knowing that snakes here. And that gives context. But the image here of bathing or washing is that the enemy has been destroyed. There is a battle with blood. Though here, it seems as if back to the beginning, only the leaders of justice are being addressed, which does not indicate a huge number necessarily. So that's my only you know, fine tuning 
to try to come to a sense of what is the image. Could be either way. Thank you, though, Marvin. Very helpful. Arnold, last comment, and we'll pull Very it together with Kaddish. Very quickly, um, uh, what, what came to my mind was um, the need for a, a serious reexamination of the uh, commandment, thou shalt not murder. Yeah, so a comment in what sense, Arnold? Say one more well, word about that. Yeah, it, I mean, we have that commandment. And right. yet the, the story of David, um, you know, in, in is, you know, is one of murder, vengeance. Yeah. Um, and the like. So I, I don't have an answer. I don't, you know, I just wanted to just bring up the point. So I just want to react to Arnold because it's a very important point. One, a couple comments, you know, when we have in the in the Ten Commandments, altered sach, we Jews translate that as thou shall not murder. While in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which becomes the normative Catholic translation, it is thou shall not kill which is how the Catholic Church um, opposes capital punishment, meaning any taking of life by the state would violate, while for Jews it's only um, taking of life that's unjustified, so self-defense would not be uh, murder, it might be killing. That's, a, that's something worth knowing in terms of translations impacting philosophy and law later in religious traditions. You know, I would assume that David would say that, well, one, this is a psalm of vengeance. That word is used explicitly in verse 11, nakam, vengeance. Um, and that is troubling to take life as a result of vengeance, though I would assume that in the ancient times they would say it was all a matter of self-defense. That, you know, th there weren't jails the way we think of jails. If you have an enemy who seeks to kill you, and that could also be through injustice, um, then self-defense means you eliminate the threat. Still very disturbing in a modern sense um, where we do have other choices um, to, to, to quell violence rather than to respond by violence. To pull this together and to link it to yesterday's Psalms because the two Psalms are linked by moments in David's life um, I did enjoy some of the concluding reactions, which is um, not seeking um, immediate vengeance, but it is the wicked who will fall into their own pits rather than seek to injure violently the enemy, which this seems to suggest, which is why, because these two are linked, that people like Samson Raphael Hirsch will say, here too, the evil will ultimately be the source of their own downfall. Tomorrow, today we had a focus on vipers. Tomorrow we have a psalm that some people read when fearing dogs. Psalm 59, and you'll see, I entitle it, they howl like a dog and prowl the city. So a key image, it gets repeated twice tomorrow, is the image of dangerous dogs. Um, it's the last of this trilogy, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that are all Tashchet, psalms which are entitled, Do Not Destroy. Kind of an ironic title for <laughs> psalms of um, seeking to destroy. So with that, and hopefully looking forward to a good day, we rise to honor loved ones with the reciting of Kaddish, the mourner's prayer, which I begin to recite with anyone observing a yurt site or in mourning who would like to join. Yitkadal, Yitkadash, Shemei Rabbah, Yimama, Divra, Kirite, Viyamlich, Malchute, Bechaye Khon, Uvyome Khon, Ufhaye de Khal Beit Yisrael, Baagala Uvisman Kari, Vimru Vimru Ame, Yehei Rabba Mifarah, Le Olam Omeya, Yitbarach, Vijtabach, Vijtpaar, Vijtromam, Vijtnase, 
Vita Dar, Vita Le, Vita Lal, Shame the Kudja, Berichu, Le Ela, Miko, Birchata, Vishirata, Tushbechata, Venechemata, Damiran, Bioma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe, Shlama, Rabba, Min Shemaya. Vahayim Alenu Vyoko Yisrael Vimru Amen O say Shalom Vimramav Hu Yaase Shalom Alenu Vyoko Yisrael Vakol Yoshve Tevel Vimru Amen To each of you, thank you for coming together for the study today. I hope to share Psalm 59 with you tomorrow at 9.30. Next week, on to the Psalms in the 60s. <laughs> be well. May it be a day of positivity. Be well. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Rev.